cool? And here they come. The Magi. We have this song, We Three Kings, that we sing even. And I love this word, arise. It's, it's an imperative. It's an invitation. Not a burden, but, but a call to response to something greater, to the greater things of God. A new thing that God has done to bring light into the darkness. And it starts with this word, arise. And I think that word, arise, speaks to us today. Arise. Take action. Have a response. Something has happened. You know, we look at the world into which the Lord comes, and it says for us in that passage that the world was dark, had darkness around it. And I think the people of that time had kind of become used to the darkness, you know? I mean, you can be in a situation that's not good, and if you stick around it long enough, it kind of becomes the norm. You ever notice that? And before you're aware of it, the norm is the darkness, and that's it, and it's not great, but it's not the worst thing, maybe. And we can, if we're not careful, we can kind of mix with a situation that's not right or good or God's best. And I think this passage is big because it seems like the people at this time did not understand the need for something more. You know, Scripture, those that are hungry, those that want more, those that are seeking, those that are going after the greater things of God, over and over again, what happens? They find it. They find it. When a person is unsatisfied, they find it. You know, we come into this, this, new, this new year, and we oftentimes make resolutions, right? Because we want to get things better. You know, someone might say, okay, I'm going to, you know, go to the gym and work out three times a week. Or I'm going to, you know, walk my dog every day. I'm going to spend more time with my kids. I'm going to write a book. I'm going to paint a painting. I'm going to wear better shoes. But, but whatever it is, we make a decision to do something because we become aware that we're not satisfied with how we are, right? I am unsatisfied with my weight, and so I'm going to make a, a, a commitment to take that and make that better. It's actually true, by the way. We'll see how it goes this year. But I'm not satisfied with where I am. And we're told in Jeremiah 29 that if we seek God, we'll find Him when we seek Him with all of our hearts. Matthew 7 talks about if, if we knock, the door will be opened. If we seek, we will find. If we want to find the greater things of God, the more of God, the bigger things that God wants to, to teach us and show us, if we want to find those things, if we're not satisfied, God promises we'll find it. And as we look at this story today, I think a question for us that comes is, are we hungry? You know, do we want more? It becomes so easy to become content with where we are. And whereas maybe it's not the best thing, it's not the worst, so eh, we're okay. You ever feel that way? It's until we realize a need that we can begin to make change and grow. And oftentimes it takes an epiphany, a realization of something we didn't before understand. I, I came across a an interview, there's a, there's a guy named John Madden who's a, a football, a great football championship football coach as well as a broadcaster. He's kind of a funny broadcaster, so he's kind of well known. He's retired now. But I saw this interview when John Madden was a young, young football coach many, many, many years ago. He thought that he had it all figured out. He was winning a lot. He had a great success rate. He was winning and he said, yeah, you know, and he went to a, a seminar taught by a coach named Vince Lombardi. Do we know who Vince Lombardi is? I'm, Talking NFL here, so maybe some of you don't know. He was the greatest, many consider, football coach. And he said that he went to this, to this, 
this teaching of this conference, and Lombardi taught for eight hours, four hours, 20 minute break, four hours, on one play in his playbook, the Packers sweep. Eight hours on one play. And he realized how much he didn't understand when he saw what Lombardi was teaching, because he really was the greatest. And for some of us, maybe we need that, that thing that, that helps us to understand, that gives us a hunger for more. And this is what we find in the Magi. These guys are living more than a thousand miles away from Bethlehem, and yet they're hungry for God. Okay? Today we have like astrology and what's your sign on stuff. That's not of God stuff. But back then, they, these guys looked to the stars for a sign from God. It was a much different way of looking at stars than what we have today. And I think we can have this idea of the Magi as the three funny looking guys on camels with the pointy hats. You guys ever seen those? You know, the, the, either it's the nativity play or it's the movie or whatever it is. They're kind of, they're kind of comic and they come along on the, on the three camels and they show up in the manger with the, with the, with the, uh, the shepherds. Well, in reality, they came uh, quite a bit time later. And as we look at history, we see that um, these guys were very important, wealthy leaders of their nations. At minimum, they would have brought with them a full military escort along with many servants. Probably more than 300 came with the Magi as they came across the desert. And as they came from the east into Jerusalem and then Bethlehem. And so it's no surprise that we see how important and distinguished they are. They come through Jerusalem, a lot of fanfare, covered in dust. They show up at the door of the capital, knock on the door, and are entered and are let in. I mean, three dudes on camels are not going to be able to see the president if they were to show up today. But these guys are important, they're well known, and the king greets them and wants to please them. Because they carry importance. And they ask, and they say to him, we have found, we, have, we, we believe we're, that there's a new king born, a son of God, a ruler. Where is the child, in verse 4, it says, to be born and it's funny, you know, the scribes and all the people there don't even have to look it up. Because everyone at this time would have gone to basic um, Jewish school and they would have known that 700 years earlier, the prophet Micah in Micah 5.2 prophesied that Bethlehem would be the place where the Messiah would come. It was actually common knowledge to those who were familiar with the Word of God and it's funny that Herod didn't know it. According to what I saw in my research, little children learned this in Sabbath school around the age of six. Micah 5, 2, the Messiah would come in Bethlehem. And the word comes to the Magi, Bethlehem's the location, and what do they do? They get on their, their camels, they get their caravan together, and they rush off to find him. You know what's funny to me? You look at this, at this scripture, and everyone knew the place, yet the Bible does not record one religious leader or one person from Herod's court going to Bethlehem to see if there's a Savior there. Isn't that funny? These guys come a thousand miles. They don't know the customs. They don't know the word of God. Yet they believe they can find the more of God that he's told them about. And they, and they, all the religious leaders, all the people in Herod's court, no one makes the five mile journey. Does that strike you? No one makes a response. No one says, oh gosh, yes, I really want to see this Messiah. And you wonder why. I mean, what was so important to them, you know? You know, carpet cleaners are coming. 
new movie on TV that night they hadn't seen before? Great new puzzle they got for Christmas they want to put together? Whatever the reason was, they had reasons. They had excuses. They had reasons why they didn't want to go find this more of God. It's funny, you know, the angels didn't appear to dignitaries or to the military leaders. They appeared to the shepherds who were the outcasts. But they were willing to listen. They were hungry to encounter that which God had for them. And because that's where they lived, they experienced the greatest miracle. I think it's important to remember also that God is always speaking loud enough for those of us that are willing to hear. God is always speaking. And the question is, are we willing to hear? You know, I prayed about something um, last week, and I caught myself asking God, but really not asking him. You know what I mean? God, what should I do here? Is the answer yes? I think the answer is yes. What do you think? Yes, God? Yeah? Right? Is it yes? I'm not really hearing a no. It must be yes. You know, do you ever do that? Because you want it so bad you want to read it in? You say, God, it's, it's yes. <laughs> I'm really sure that it's yes. I'm praying for it, but I, I know it's yes. You ever do that? God is always speaking if we're willing to hear. The wise men heard something and arose and did something. The religious leaders knew the truth and yet did nothing. I love how they begin their track out of, um, out of Jerusalem and it says the star reappears in verse 9. It's this miraculous star. And as we look at, um, at the history um, I saw this thing in U.S. News World Report where there actually was a supernova at that time they could track back on. And now you can still see that star, supposedly. Again, this is the article. Um, it's just very far away now because it's been a lot of years. But how there was actually at this time, and, and science confirms this, there was a, a major supernova star in the sky at the time of Jesus' birth. I love how it's even confirmed um, scientifically. And they go and they come, and it says in verse 11, on coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and they worshipped him. They've just been to King Herod's castle with his guards and his fountains and his dancing elephants and his fruit platters, and all of the nobility is everywhere. And they come into this dumpy little Bethlehem to a, a house that's in poverty, and they come up, up with this child, and the first thing they do is worship. They were able to see in the Spirit they were able to see the things of God in the face of the natural, which said, eh, they saw the, the majestic. Because they were looking with eyes of faith. He had no scepter. He commanded no armies. He gave no speeches. He passed no laws. He could not walk or talk. To the outward eye, he was a peasant child in the most impoverished of circumstances. But to the magi, he was a king. He possessed more royalty than anyone they had ever met. They had asked God to reveal the greater things. They saw it and they responded with worship. Isn't that good? Great. The Greek word for worship used here literally means to kiss towards and intensely adore. I love that. To kiss toward and intensely adore. Whew. You know, and... Bringing gifts in this culture was a big deal because it's what someone did to someone who was a superior. 
You know, when you came into the presence of someone who was superior to you, you brought them a gift to honor them. It was about honor. And so they bring these three gifts to honor this king. And the Lord, of course, uses these gifts prophetically to reveal to all of us the meaning behind Jesus. Let's look at the gifts for a moment here. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. <clears throat> the first one, gold, is one of the rarest metals. It represents wealth and the power of a king. Frankincense was used in the temple for worship of God. It represents Jesus' deity. God born in, human, in a human's body. And the third one is myrrh. It's a kind of perfume made out of the leaves of a rose. It was used in the beauty treatments of the day. If you were a well-to-do lady, you would put a little myrrh on yourself. It's very nice. What's that, um, the, the pink thing? It was like better than the, what's the, late, what's the, the there's a, Mary Kay. I, guess like, I, don't, I, don't, I don't use Mary Kay, but it's, <laughs> right? It's the beauty treatments of the day, you know? It's better than Mary Kay. Put a little myrrh on yourself. Woo! John 19, 39 tells us that after, Jesus, after Jesus died, his body was wrapped in linen with 75 pounds of myrrh. The gold pointed to his majesty. He's a king, frankincense to his deity, for he is God, and myrrh to his humanity, for he was destined to suffer and to die for us. Did the Magi know all these things? I think they probably did not know the magnitude of the prophecy they were calling forth. But God knew, and God ordained it, and it was all as God intended. Then we can learn a few things from these guys. The first one is that God met them in the midst of their work. They were doing what they were supposed to be doing, and God spoke to them. So I don't want you to feel like you have to run away and go up on a mountain somewhere for two weeks for God to speak to you. God can speak to you right where you are, right where you're at. God meets you and can give you his truth. The second thing we can learn from these guys is they found their way by consulting Scripture. God's Word told them where to go, and they found Savior. The third thing is this, is they gave themselves in worship first. Do you, you ever feel, you ever have a day where you feel like you've got to do something and you don't want to do it? Anybody? Ever? You know, and so you wake up and say, oh, I've got to do this today. Oh, I don't want to do it. You know, and, and it's, it's awful. And as soon as you start doing it, what? You feel better, right? Usually. Not like breaking up with a girlfriend or a boyfriend, but you know, like doing errands. You know, and, and something happens for us when we worship, when we prostrate ourselves, when we bow ourselves, when we engage in worshiping God. Something happens inside of us and we grow closer to Him. You ever, you feel that? You notice that? I mean, even when we take a, you know, in a, a stance of just humbling ourselves, I'm, I'm, I'm acknowledging something else in my place. Physically, something will happen to us as we engage in, in, in lowering ourselves and raising up God in our understanding. Maybe it's singing. Maybe it's dancing. Maybe it's lifting our hands. Whatever it is, as we do these things, even when we don't feel like it, God comes and, and becomes more real and they, they see the importance of worship. If these wise men can find Jesus, then anyone can find Jesus. Anybody who's willing, anybody who's hungry. And we see also that God provides guides to those who are seeking. You ever feel that way? You're like, well, I would, I'd do better if, if I had a guide. Anybody? You know, if I had a map or I knew where I was going, if I had a guide... I could, I, could, I could find, or I could, I could see that thing. And many of us actually have those guides in our lives, but we want to ignore them. You ever have that? I know I should do X, but that wouldn't be fun. God always gives us guides. God always gives us directions. You know, maybe we're waiting for that, that laser bright star, or that neon sign saying, do this. But we're reminded here that God speaks to us in a language that we can understand. It happened for the wise men. 
They might have liked someone to fall out of the sky and say, follow me. And he actually gives them a star to do this. They could understand that language, and he spoke to them in a language they were able to understand when they took action. And that's the last one. They were willing to take action. We have to take action to get where we want to go. I mean, it's a really big thing. You know, we have to take action to get where we want to go. Um, if I had never asked my wife out on a date, I'd still be a single guy here with all of you, with no kids. I had to take action to get what I wanted. And if we want the greater things of God, we have to pursue them. We have to want them and hunger after them and take risk in doing things that might be uncomfortable, but that can lead to the greatest of results. So um, today what we do is, is we have what we call epiphany stars to the church. This is a, this is a um, tradition that we have, and we're going to hand the stars out here in a, in a minute. Um, and as they come along, you're going to have a word on your star. And for you in the coming year in 2014, I pray that whatever the word is that God's going to give you today will speak to an area of your life prophetically of an area that God wants you to grow in or to help somebody else in or to find victory in. Maybe your word's going to be patience. I had someone come to me after the service and say, oh, my word is patience. Oh, it's the worst. It's actually the greatest because God knows what we need. I got the word wisdom in the first service. And I think it was a great word because wisdom is so vital for where I believe the Lord is leading our church and our ministry. So I'm going to pray over these epiphany stars. Mary Lou's going to hand them out to each person. Please take only one. I know it would be fun to have three or four or five, but please take only one, and may they be a prophetic word for your life in 2014. If you have a spouse or a loved one who's not here and you take one for them, that's okay. Go for it. I think that's good. So Lord God, we thank you. We thank you that you give us words of prophecy to build up your body, to encourage us, to strengthen us. Lord God, we were called to walk the Christian faith as family, encouraging each other, walking with each other, being in the low spots together, sharing your truth and your goodness with each other, doing life together, even in the mess. And Lord God, we've seen some mess in the last year. There have been mistakes. There have been disagreements. And we know, Lord, that in a church that is seeking the Holy Spirit, there are going to be mistakes. There are going to be disagreements. There's going to be uh, things that don't go smoothly. But, God, we give all these things to you. And we pray that these words that we're now about to receive would speak prophetically to each one of our lives for what you have in store for us in 2014 an area to grow in, an area to draw closer to you in in our lives. Maybe it's an area to invest in another person in. But Lord, may each word carry for us your prophetic word for our lives. And Lord, if we want clarification for the word, let us know that we can talk to pastor here and he'll try to clarify everything we have questions about. But so, Lord God, now as we receive the words, I pray that you would prophetically speak to each person. Give us direction. Give us encouragement. Strengthen this body. Build us up for your purposes and your plans. Lord God, you are the God that is able. And we receive these words from you for 2014 with joy. Holy Spirit, your Work be done here in this time now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so please take us. Help us spread the message. 
Click on the donate button below or go to shermanoakspc.org forward slash donate. And thank you.